I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York. A popular and handsome wrestling coach comes home, and someone's waiting behind the front door. Next thing you know, he was getting shot at. Was it a robbery gone wrong, or a case of deadly revenge? As detectives will uncover, Garth Rector's love life was packed with motives for murder. There was more than one girl that he was dating. One of them had a husband. Then he's the smooth talker whose run for the New York State Senate ended behind bars. You've been called a liar, a con man, calculating, a psychopath, a sociopath. Wow. Amy. Police say this political hotshot is really a money-hungry con man who ran a $50,000 scam on Craigslist. He looked like a playboy. My worst fear came true in life. He calls me and starts to put, like fake cry. I chased that man all over this city. Today, the controversial candidate on the hot seat for his first interview since his arrest. All I can tell you in response to that, if this was a movie, the people would be siding with me right now and cheering me on. Plus, a major break in a case you saw first on Crime Watch Daily. The body of missing college student Zuzu Vert, tragically found in a shallow grave. Today, why this man in the interview with our Jason Matera, Chris Estrada, do you know what happened to Zuzu? Is now under arrest. How do I know right now you're not BSing me? You wouldn't, though. Right now. Andrea Isom, sir, with Crime Watch yeah. Daily. Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. This. I'm Elizabeth. I'm here with Crime Watch. I'm Michelle from Crime Watch Daily. Anna Garcia from Crime Watch. Is Crime Watch oh, Daily. Stay off my property. We'll find you again. We always do. Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. We start today in Indiana, where Garth Rector's sister says her brother loved women and women loved him. However, now she's wondering if a jealous boyfriend or husband is behind Garth's murder. Garth Rector is a handsome high school wrestling coach recently separated from his wife, but wildly popular. Everybody had something good to say about him. It turns out Garth may be just a little too popular for his own good. There was more than one girl that he was dating at the time. One of them had a husband. Family and friends say the 48-year-old was living alone in this small rented house, going through what they call a midlife crisis. That's really the only thing I could see at that time that maybe he was going through was just separation with my mom. He had told me he wanted to do counseling to make things right. Tragically, Garth will never get that chance. He walks into what he thought was his empty house with a bag of groceries in one hand, a soda in the other, and somebody was winning for him with a gun. Looks like he just sat a grocery sack and a cup down, and next thing you know, he was getting shot at. A barrage of bullets cut him down where he stood in the kitchen. He was shot five times. The first shot was from a distance of maybe 30 feet through a couple doorways. It appears that all shots hit the target. It appears like somebody was a pretty good, fairly good shot. But finding out who pulled the trigger will be no easy task. There was forced entry into the house. It was a back side door. The window pane had been broken out. It looked like someone had made entry into a breezeway, which then led into a kitchen where the body was found. A brutal execution style killing leaving family and friends stunned in grief. I miss my brother every day, more than I thought I could ever miss anyone. And leaving cops still wondering, is it a case of a robbery gone terribly wrong, or could it be a jealous revenge? We've actually got tips leading both ways. Who wanted Garth Rector dead and why? I just didn't understand why anybody would wanna hurt such an amazing person. April Sanchez will always be grateful for the last time she spoke with her dad, Garth. I told him how much I loved him and that that was amazing. I was very lucky and I remember that moment all the time. In fact, a lot of people in this hometown of Muncie, Indiana have good memories of Garth Rector. He was a high school wrestler that came up and then got into coaching. A lot of kids and parents knew him from the wrestling scene. But only a few knew anything about his private life. The part involving other women and possibly some very jealous men. Garth did tend to gravitate towards people who were in need and 
if a woman was not happy in her marriage and started speaking with Garth, I could see that it could lead to other things. And at least one of those women is very close to Garth since his recent separation. She's his landlady, living on the same property, and she brings some baggage to the table. The landlord who was in a relationship with Garth, uh, she'd recently broke up with a boyfriend, a long-term boyfriend. They were engaged at the time. Uh, he was an older gentleman. It sounds like he took it pretty rough. But family members say Garth was also trying to repair his marriage to Angie Sue Rector. And he's taking a big step in that direction with a vacation to California. Along with his wife, Angie Sue, his daughter, April, and his sister, Angela. He was focused on committing to making things better for he and April and him and Angie. He told people that his plan was to come back home after the vacation. They're headed to San Diego to visit Garth's older sister, Marty, to celebrate her retirement from the military. He even told me that the last time I talked to him. I I'm looking so forward to, you know, you coming home and us picking up where we left off before you went into the Marine Corps. We were both very positive and looking forward to the future. Angie Sue and Garth's sister Angela fly to Las Vegas and plan to drive to the coast from there. Meanwhile, Garth and April prepare to fly together for the trip that could bring their family closer than ever. I knew we were leaving the next morning, but I just, I couldn't sleep. I was super excited about heading to San Diego. And as big moments sometimes do, the occasion brings out some tension in the family. We had previously gotten into a little argument um, about his living situation and if him and my mom were going to get back together. The next day, it's almost like God did this on purpose for us. Um, I received a letter from my dad and it was, well, it was a card and inside the card was a newspaper clipping and it was a picture of a softball team he was in and I was on his shoulders and it just touched me and he wrote how much he loved me and how proud he was of me in the card and I called him and I just apologized and I told him how much I loved him. That was my last moment with him instead of just, hey, I'm sorry, I love you. Like it was a moment and I'll always have that newspaper clipping. But tomorrow's scheduled flight to California is going to leave without Garth Rector. He said, Garth got shot and he's dead. I fell to my knees and almost passed out. Then Marty breaks the shocking details to Angela and Garth's estranged wife, Angie Sue. And uh, we sat on the couch and she said, um, Garth has been shot and he's dead. And it was just silence. And I just, I just kept staring at her because I thought she was joking. Angie immediately got hysterical, crying. Um, we just didn't understand what was going on. Angela immediately struggles to get to the bottom of this horrific killing. She's compelled to visit the crime scene but it's not easy. And I saw the blood splatters, I saw the gunshot holes, and then it was just disbelief that my brother had died in that spot. It was like a dream. It was like it wasn't true. I was just saying, Garth, tell me. Tell me who did this. As silly as that seems, only Garth knows. Only Garth knew. Up next, cops uncover a romantic triangle. In fact, more than one triggering multiple murder scenarios that play like a soap opera on steroids. That could have definitely uh, been a factor in his murder. Today would have been Garth Rector's 57th birthday. Sadly, his family is spending it not celebrating, but rather wondering who would have shot him dead inside the Indiana home he was renting. Police say that Garth Rector was close to more than one woman in his last days and none closer than the woman who literally lived across the yard and was the first to discover his lifeless body in the kitchen hours after his murder. They were in a relationship. He was actually renting the house he was living in off of her. Their houses were 200 feet apart. She went over to visit him, located him on the floor, ran out of the house, called uh, 911. But Corporal Kurt Walther says the close relationship between Garth and his landlady could be a big source of trouble in the form of her ex-fiance. She had recently broke up with a boyfriend, a long-term boyfriend. They were engaged at the time. Uh, he was an older gentleman. 
Sounds like he took it pretty rough. What's more, he knows his way around Garth's house too. We had a subject that had some motive, had the opportunity. Uh, he'd been in the house before. Uh, his DNA shows up in the house, it's nothing new. Uh, he actually replaced some windows in the house. And he carries more than just a hammer. The person is a avid gun collector. This gentleman never misses work. He missed work that day. Uh, his alibi was not concrete at all. Walther says the man in question took a voice stress test analysis and was asked to follow up with a polygraph, but has refused. This person was very much a person of interest. He's still a person of interest. But hold on. It turns out this handsome, recently separated wrestling coach had another love interest, leading to yet another person of interest. A woman who worked with Garth at the university. A married woman with a husband who police have been giving a close look, but who also isn't talking. During the investigation, we did uh, attempt to polygraph one of those subjects and he would not return calls. Police are tight with the information and providing no names or images of the individuals in the investigation. But Walther says there's a short list of persons of interest who are climbing up. Some people needed polygraph, and I would like to still bring them in and polygraph them. A few of them have dodged my phone calls. It does raise your suspicion, and that is one of the reasons this is still open case. And if that's not enough to make an investigator's head spin, consider this. Cops also say the killing may have had absolutely nothing to do with Garth's extracurricular love life. Basically, we did receive a tip here recently and within the last six months that would put the scenario more back to a burglary case. It's definitely not unusual for a daylight burglary, especially in the country. Uh, it happens quite often when people just go up and knock on the door, they'll see if someone's home, they'll walk around the back, kick the door in, go in the house. The troubling thing about the robbery theory Police say nothing was taken from the house. In fact, they found hundreds of dollars still in Garth's pocket. But cops claim the killer could have panicked when Garth walked into the kitchen, fired the shots, and ran off without taking anything. He's a pretty stout guy, pretty stocky, <clears throat> ex-wrestler. Uh, he comes home, confronts somebody in the house. They're armed. The only way out of the house is through him. That's why we're thinking maybe someone actually shot him to get out of the house there's no way out of the house but through where Garth was at. And at least one witness reports unusual behavior at the house around the time of the murder. This happened right at the time when schools were letting out and there's buses going down the road. They were getting ready to get off the bus. The bus had to hit the brakes because the vehicle was backing out at a high rate of speed out of the driveway. Police may be giving more attention to the attempted robbery scenario at the moment, but to some, like family spokesperson Angela, the motive and the suspicions are clear. There are some other leads out there that have come forward that it could have been a botched robbery. Um, and they're gonna have to prove that to me before me to, to get it out of my head that it wasn't an upset, jealous husband. And no one would like the truth more than Angie Sue Rector, Garth's estranged wife, agreed to speak with Crime Watch Daily to plead for information. Have it in your heart and know what's right and do what's right for um, in your own self as well as ours uh, to come forward. Um, you'll be protected. At the time of his murder, Angie Sue was reportedly trying to reconcile with Garth, and she is all in on the effort to find his killer, keeping the case alive by raising a cash reward for any information leading to a conviction. The first Garth uh, Fest, we raised $10,000, and it still stands to this day that we have that um, out there for information leading to the um, arrest of the person that uh, killed Garth. Who did kill Garth Rector? Cops are still entertaining both theories, a botched robbery and a possible series of tangled love stories. But now, cops and family members need someone to come forward with more information about who committed this vicious murder so the killer can be held accountable. If I could see Garth's killer face to face, I would just love to ask them why. Why would you do this? Was she worth it? They took away that person, the person that walks me down the aisle that will be the grandfather to my children. Um, they took it all away. There's now a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of Garth's killer or killers. You can leave an anonymous tip on Muncie's Crime Stoppers hotline. That number is 765-286-4050.
Let's help this family finally get some closure. Coming up, he was first grilled by Crime Watch Daily after a college student vanished without a trace. Did you have anything to do with her disappearance? I did not. Now, major new developments in the heartbreaking case of Zuzu Vert. That's next. We're back now with breaking news on the mysterious disappearance of college student Zuzu Vert. We first told you about the 22-year-old who went missing several months ago in Alpine, Texas. Today, there have been several huge developments, including two arrests in connection with the case. Jason Matera has the very latest. Do you know what happened to Zuzu? It's an interview you only saw on Crime Watch Daily, an interview with new meaning today. Chris Estrada grilled about the disappearance of Zuzu Vert. Did you have anything to do with her disappearance? I did not. Today, we've got breaking news on the troubling mystery. Estrada is now behind bars. So is his friend, Robert Fabian, who was Verk's boyfriend at the time she went missing. And with a heavy heart, investigators confirmed her family's worst fear. We do have a positive ID through dental records that uh, remains found in Brewster County where that of Zuzu Verk. She's just a beautiful ray of light. The vibrant 22-year-old college student vanished without a trace after a night with her boyfriend, Robert Fabian. According to the newly released arrest warrant, Robert told investigators he invited Zuzu over for a romantic dinner that included a massage. But he says the two got into an argument about his ex-girlfriend, and he watched her drive away between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. Zuzu would never be seen again. Helicopters ground search. We covered every cul-de-sac, every neighborhood in town. Zuzu had only been missing for about a month when we first went to Alpine, Texas to investigate. At the time, police seemed to be looking at one man and one man only. Lori, what were your initial impressions of Robert? You know, as any parent might think, well, yeah, he's nice, but he's not good enough for you, <laughs> for my daughter. I texted Robert and said, have you heard from her? And he said, oh no, I thought I was just giving her space. I haven't heard from her either. I thought she was ignoring me. And he found out that she had missed a shift at work, that she didn't show up for her midterms. After that, Zuzu's parents relocate to Alpine to help with the search. As for Robert, he was suddenly nowhere to be seen. I mean, we were all embracing each other. We're going through all kinds of emotions and uh, desperate to find her. And everyone in town, all of her friends, were out there with us, and he was the only one that was missing. According to search warrant affidavits, on the night Zuzu disappeared, Robert makes two unanswered phone calls to his good friend, Chris Estrada, who sat down with Crime Watch Daily for over an hour answering every question I had. In my opinion, you can read a lot about a person by just their eyes. It was to be his first ever TV interview. Are you gonna be honest with us? Deal. You didn't have to do this interview. Why'd you do it? No one is, you know, vocally standing up for our, my side or Robert. It's just been one-sided. So you don't think Robert had anything to do with Zuzu's disappearance? Mm -hmm. We'd be circling back to that question. But first, I wanted to know more about how Chris got pulled into the case in the first place. All right, police say that Robert called you twice, 3.15 a.m. Mm -hmm. on October 12th. What did Robert want to talk about at 3.15 a.m.? And remember, this is the early morning where it is believed Zuzu goes missing. He never really said later on at some point, he just asked me if I wanted to help him paint a table. And I said, sure. Paint a table at 3.15 a.m.? Those three words will take on new significance later in this story. The police also say that you picked up Robert in your Mustang later that day. Correct. Why? We cruised around and we went back to his place we just had. You know, a few drinks. Nothing seemed off about him? He was laughing, smiling. Seemed fine to me. 
And then came the big moment. The main reason I wanted to talk to Chris in the first place. I want to make it very clear. You, Chris Estrada, do you know what happened to Zuzu? I do not. Did you have anything to do with her disappearance? I did not. You were not an accomplice to a crime? No. Is Zuzu still alive? I don't know. Are you covering for Robert at all? Mm -mm. I do a lot of these interviews. And I'm wondering whether I should believe you. How do I know right now you're not BSing me? You wouldn't know. And technically, he was right. We wouldn't know. But we did find someone who might. Why are you leaving those elements out? We brought in expert interrogation specialist Stan the Lie Guy Walters, who helps train police officers around the country in the art of detecting deception. Stan, and I spent over an hour with Chris Estrada asking him some very tough questions, and you went ahead and scrutinized that interview. Mm -hmm. Overall thoughts on Chris Estrada? In my opinion, Chris is withholding a lot of information that would be critical to this investigation. It's an opinion Stan says he formed after watching for certain facial cues, or what he calls emotional leaks. There's several places noticed in his interview that he demonstrated his contempt for the interview, contempt for the situation, that you're beneath me. And one of those moments, Stan says, came right at the beginning of our conversation. Are you going to be honest with us? Deal. You see the movement over here, see how this cheek is higher? Mm -hmm. It's that really whatever. It's what Stan calls a contempt signal. It's contempt like, I'm fooling with this. If you ask me these questions, who are you to question this? And it's a contempt toward the other individual, disdain, dislike, scorn, that the other person is beneath me. But of all the telling moments from our conversation, it was the end that caught Stan's attention the most. Do you know what happened to Zuzu? I do not. Get that quick, real fast contempt. Are you covering for Robert at all? And you got a huge reaction out of that. One of the, one of the big responses you got. Stan calls it an anger signal and says he saw it in Chris. Their emotions are hardwired. They're very difficult to suppress. The hardest thing to accomplish is one about emotion. Stan's opinion? I don't believe he was involved, from the questions you've asked, that he was involved actually in what happened to her. But he's withholding information that would help this investigation. And that's exactly what police are saying today. After a Border Patrol agent stumbled upon the remains of Zuzu Burke, Estrada is arrested 650 miles away in Phoenix. He had just moved from Texas to Arizona. Both he and Fabian are facing a charge of tampering with evidence by concealing or hiding a corpse. Police say additional charges are expected soon. Fabian is being held on a half million dollar bond. We have specific timelines about what happened and we have ideas about what happened. That timeline is laid out in this arrest warrant affidavit. Police say the night Zuzu vanished, Fabian was captured on surveillance video using Estrada's credit card to purchase three packaged items resembling plastic painters' drop cloths. The report goes on to say thin plastic sheets that were consistent with the plastic painters' drop cloths purchased by Robert were found at the site of Zuzu's body. I want to make sure that they are prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. The news leaving Zuzu's family with mixed emotions. I'm relieved that we've found her, uh, but extremely saddened that I'm never really going to see her again. There's a lot of people that miss Zuzu. There's a lot of people that love Zuzu. I'm just gonna miss her passion and just her laugh. I'm gonna miss her laugh so much. Will you miss her advice? Not really, <laughs> but she always did give good advice. I just didn't really listen most of the time. Yeah, we'll be together again, but physically, I don't get to hold my daughter. She was taken away. So yeah, I'll miss that. The police chief in Alpine says several of Fabian's relatives, including his mom, sister, and brother-in-law, who also talked to our Jason Matera, are considered persons of interest in the case. And the chief added that more arrests, quote, will eventually be made. A memorial service for Virk was held today at Sol Ross State University, where Zuzu was studying conservation biology. Up next, they thought they had found the perfect New York City apartment until their money disappeared. 
he asks you for how much money? 9,000 total up front. And you give it to him? Yeah. Crime Watch Daily inside the headline making case that has a New York political hotshot facing major heat. For the first time, John Gerotis breaks his silence from behind bars. Sooner or later, I'll be a free man and I'll run again. And I can guarantee you. Coming up. Now to a huge headline right here in New York. A controversial political candidate who finished his race for office in a jail cell. Today, he's breaking his silence for the first time to our special correspondent, Amy Dash. Chris, behind me is the Atelier, where apartments sell for tens of millions and celebrities are neighbors. Prosecutors say Gerotis offered an apartment here for rent for only about $1,000 a month. But they soon discovered the apartment wasn't even his to rent. John Gerotis, man of the people, candidate for New York State Senate, and accused Craigslist scammer. The arrest of Smile and John Gerotis is the latest bizarre twist in the story of this political hotshot. Accused of balancing his personal budget with other people's cash. My worst fear came through in life. But if you ask him, this wannabe politico turned jailbird is now singing a different tune. I've been railroaded just like my fellow inmates uh, uh, down the line. Handsome, charming, confident. That's the vision of John Gerotis that beams from his billboards here in Harlem. Promising affordable housing for citizens of New York's 30th district. But Gerotis's campaign was hardly without controversy. At times, it seemed like a politically incorrect ticking time bomb just waiting to explode. Once, he reportedly emailed a journalist from New York television station WNBC, inviting her to a campaign fundraiser in Harlem featuring fried chicken, watermelon, and Kool-Aid. What did you think? Well, it um, looked like he had a pretty dark cloud over his head. But that's nothing compared to his latest troubles. Last fall, prosecutors say Gerotis advertised his apartment for rent on Craigslist, a gorgeous Hell's Kitchen condo in a multi-million dollar building, all for only around $1,100 a month. Mr. Gerotis would invite people to his apartment to uh, wine and dine them, and then once he uh, collected first, last security deposit, uh, he would come up with various reasons why they couldn't move in. When they say that New York is a tough city, they're not joking. Student Sarah Angela says she was taken in by the smooth-talking Senate candidate. You've got the lease signed. Mm -hmm. He asks you for how much money? 9000 total up front. And you give it to him? Yeah. But here's the problem. Sarah wasn't the only one. Author Nina Wolf says she gave Gerotis down payments of thousands of dollars. So did photographer Amanda Stevens and model McKinley Thomas. I sat down with a number of Gerotis's alleged victims. So how would you describe your impression of him when you first met him? Um, he looked like a playboy. You know, designer jeans, the very expensive white t-shirt that were all created, create the effect of I'm trying without trying and I'm spending a lot of money while doing it. They say the candidate's sales pitch starts with tall tales of life in the political spotlight. He told me that, that he was Sonia Sotomayor's uh, nephew. He had photographs all over the apartment. The Supreme that, Court Justice. Correct. It was all very believable. But they say after he pockets the cash, Gerotis and the apartment suddenly become unavailable. And when it came time to move, um, it was a thousand excuses all day long. Text messages show excuses like, the elevator is still out of commission. I am on my way to the hospital. I have a lump on the left side of my body. Or simply, not happening today. Why? It's simple, prosecutors say. Gerotis had leased that gorgeous view to over a dozen hopeful renters, many with the same move-in date. You were sitting at the building with your movers, yeah. Amanda, and Nina, you were on the stoop in Brooklyn waiting for your movers. That's correct. And I was in Washington Heights waiting for the movers that he promised me. So you were all about to move in at the same time? I, mean, the same I was day. waiting too at the hotel. You were while all of this was happening, I'm like, what is he doing? But I didn't know he was doing this. None of us so. did. 
When the renters do find out, it's a mad scramble to get their money back. They say that's when dealing with Gerotis gets even more bizarre. I chased that man all over this city. He told me to stay and meet him here, there, and everywhere. He calls me and says, yeah, I'm sorry, my sister just died, and da, da, da. And I'm like, what do you mean she died? He was like, she was here in the apartment, you know, she's been sick. And he starts to, like, fake cry. Peter, who asked us not to use his last name, was on the hook for $15,000 and says he had recorded conversations. And you're going to get your money. I'm on your side, Peter. I want you to get because it's no fun for me having you hound me. Trust me, I, I'd, rather t I'd rather give birth to a baby whale to my <laughs> all right? You so. also did, uh, in a sense, proposition me on, on text. When I said I have no place to sleep, he said, well, you can sleep in my, you can sleep here if you want and spend the night. And then he texted me, but I snore. Uh, I was like, oh my God. You know, I mean, he's really off the wall. Lawyer Pierre Gooding says Gerotis' scheme added up to a hefty payday. Right now, we believe it's about $15,000, but that's what we know about. But instead of smiling all the way to the bank, Gerotis finds himself smirking all the way to the slammer, arrested on 10 counts of grand larceny, two counts of scheme to defraud, and one count of identity theft. In fact, he actually had to sit out last November's election because he was in jail awaiting trial. It was just, I don't know, it just made me even more furious about what was going on. Coming up, Gerotis campaigns for his freedom in an exclusive interview with us from behind bars. And just wait until you hear how he plans to get to the promised land. All I can tell you, if this was a movie, the people would be siding with me right now and cheering me on. Even in cuffs, John Gerotis couldn't help but flash his trademark smile. The one-time candidate for state senate here in New York found himself in some hot water after an alleged rental scam. Today in a Crime Watch Daily exclusive, he's talking from behind bars only to our special correspondent, Amy Dash. Chris, John Gerotis' billboard is still up here on West 153rd Street. The one-time candidate for state senate was brought up on grand larceny charges in the weeks before the election. But believe it or not, his name remained on the ballot and he even managed to get some votes. He received close to 5% of the vote. Many people are wondering, why wasn't he removed from the ballot? The answer is, we have in the United States a presumption of innocence. And just because he was charged with a crime, until he is convicted, he is presumed to be innocent and has a right to be on the ballot. Attorney Lawrence Mandelker says legally an ex-con has as much right as anyone to run for office. So would the following people be eligible to run for elected office? A convicted murderer? Yes. A rapist? Convicted? A, a convicted serial rapist? Yes. A convicted pedophile? Yes. Is there any offense that disqualifies somebody from running for elected office? No. That's really good news for John Gerotis. Not only is he sitting in jail, accused of a Craigslist rental scheme, but we found he also has a history of being on the wrong side of the law. In 2001, Gerotis was put on probation for petty theft. Then 2008, even more trouble. Gerotis was accused in a check cashing scheme. He pled guilty to grand larceny and served jail time. But now he sits in a Manhattan jail awaiting trial. Hi, hey, John. He's accused of renting the same apartment to more than a dozen different people at the same time. Prosecutors claim he never turned over a working key and kept most of the money. This is your chair right here. Gerotis welcomed Crime Watch Daily behind bars for an exclusive interview to campaign for his freedom. And this is where he proved to be the consummate politician. You have more than a dozen accusers, people who say that in total you took more than $50,000 from them. Did you do that? No, I, I, no, I did not, and I, and I can't continue to answer these questions. Okay. And these accusers, by the way, it breaks my heart that they're, they're, whoever they are, that they're going through this, right? And I wish I could respond the way I want to, but, but I cannot. 
Did you list your apartment for rent? I, I can't discuss anything else, Amy. With all due respect, of course. And do you want to explain why you can't comment on this time, uh, on because the particulars? Would, just like everyone else, it, would be, it wouldn't behoove me to do so. I'm fighting for my freedom. I'm fighting for my life. As much as, and I will share the entire story at some point, now it's just not the right time, Amy. Nina Wolf was one of the few who says she got her money back after hounding Gerotis. I chased him all over the place, all over town. In fact, one block from here, I got it back. But other angry renters claim they're tired of waiting for Gerotis to pay them back. They say he used his political platform to steal their trust, and more importantly, their money. How did you feel when you discovered that this apartment was not actually for rent? <laughs> Devastated. Devastated. Oh, my God. That was terrible. Right after the rage kicks in and you think, mmm, no, you don't get to get away with this. The last time the public saw you, you were smiling, and you had just been arrested. Why were you smiling? Well, that, that's a good question. I think I was nervous, and I, uh, the absurdity of me being arrested at all, I, I, I couldn't believe I thought I was being spoofed, to be honest with you. No matter the outcome of this case, John Gerota says his political future is bright. Sooner or later, I'll be a free man and I'll run again. And I can guarantee you... You'll run I, again. I, I'm going to run for the rest of my life in New York. And Gerota says it won't be from the cops. It will be for office. He promises to fight on a platform of parking tickets, potholes. And you're not going to believe this one. Uh, Landlord-tenant issues, right? There are a lot of... Uh, crooked landlords who tried to take advantage of people from other countries, immigrants especially, who don't know what their rights are. But so, some people might hear you say that, and they're going to say he's being accused of running a Craigslist rental scam, and he's talking about trying to help people with landlord rights. All I can tell you in response to that, if this was a movie, the people would be siding with me right now and cheering me on. There are two sides to every story. That's what makes this country great. And I believe in the justice system, and I'm just going through the motions now. Are you innocent? I. I cannot comment whether I'm innocent or guilty. You're asking me today on camera, right? I, I'd say yes, of course. I haven't had my opportunity to explain anything. I've been railroaded just like my fellow inmates uh, uh, down the line. You've been called a liar, a con man, calculating, a psychopath, a sociopath. Wow. Amy, All these uh, things. It's very hard to, uh, to have someone tell you, and, and it hurts, to be honest with you. Are you any of those things? No. And what will you say to people who say, this guy is crazy if he thinks he's going to run for office again and win. It's America. You can do anything.